Okay, anyway, so hi, thank you so much for coming. I'm Mimo Chanayoka, uh, founder of Dusky Projects, or in sci-fi, who works? So go ahead and, all right. I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of what we do. It's a group of misfits and we make horror and sci-fi projects for adult and young adult audiences. Uh, I'm really kind of the center, it's really more <laughs> the one man band is so many <laughs> female led anything is, but I collaborate with lots of different artists um different projects but one thing that is always a common thread is that it is horror it is sci-fi it is under speculative fiction as one audience member noted nerd shit so <laughs> <laughs> next one in various different forms uh we make transmedia projects for those who don't know what the heck transmedia means it is when there is one story told in multiple disciplines this particular project starts with a concept album it's a web series and it also has a live performance and it's all one world. So we do projects like that. For this one, it was a lot of collaborations with international artists. Some of the web series was shot in Budapest, uh, working with hip hop, uh, actually, yeah, hip hop artists based here in Philly too, if I'm remembering correctly, as well as filmmakers and um, theater actors, theater directors, it's a very huge, huge piece. Uh, next one. We also work in just short films, also horror and sci-fi. Uh, these two were shot in New York and got some good festival play, and you can see them on my website. <laughs> and the last one, oh, still, no, 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 stay there, stay there. Go back, keep Ooh. going. Yes. One more, no, no. Oh, this way. Forward. We're going forward. This yes. way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, as I was saying, short films, and it also includes young audiences as well. Um, this particular project is very community-based. I shot it with a youth theater organization called People's Theater in Washington Heights, as well as the uh, middle school in East New York that I was working with. So it really was our movie and we did pretty well on the film festival circuit. I'm currently looking for a streaming home for this. So if anybody is interested, I got a short movie and a short film. It's horror for kids. Uh, it, it is, it does border on a kind of edutainment sort of space where we would have talkbacks with at different places. So there was a screening tour that took place at libraries and youth organizations that usually involve some kind of civic engagement. So the short film was really a tool to spark conversation, uh, different things in, in this particular short film, although it is through the lens of horror, for those of you who remember Goosebumps or Are You Afraid of the Dark, it's very much like in that vibe. However, there's like a sub theme here of food justice and also changing school policies. So some pretty interesting conversations that we had with young folks and older folks. There's a moral to the story. There's an open ending to spark debate between generations. I don't know if I want to, <laughs> yeah, there's a moral, but like, no. Um, okay, next one. And lastly, we do audio work. So I'm here to talk about, as you know, on the poster, Black women are scary. This is the project that was funded by Velocity Fund. Yay, Velocity Fund! Okay, so this project uh, started in the pandemic. <laughs> um, it, in, the, in its inception, we were going to have live readings, so just gathering people to tell ghost stories and really shine a spotlight on BIPOC authors working in this genre. Essentially, it was a call. I was like, I can't be the only horror nerd. I know there's more people out here. And I just kind of like put out a call and got all these people back. So for those of you who are interested in speculative fiction, in horror, in sci-fi, and want to read up and coming authors, this podcast is that. It's meant to be a hub for you to find those folks and be like, who's coming out with some new thing over here? And just go to Black Women Are Scary and you'll find some new folks. Uh, next one. So this is just season one, some of the alumni authors that we worked with. Uh, they're all fantastic. If you follow us on Instagram or Twitter, there's each month we're spotlighting a different author. We give you all the information you can about them. There's lots of other episodes that follow their fully produced work, which airs the first Friday of every month, after which we have a Flash Fiction Friday where we have special guests, other people in the horror community, YouTubers, uh, reviewers, bloggers, 
you name it, video game people <laughs> coming on and speaking about the episode that just came out, having a good time, and sometimes writing and or reading other flash fiction. So it's an opportunity to get to know yet more authors working in this particular genre. And then the last Friday of the month is Final Friday, which is the interview with the author. Uh, so yeah, right now we just had Alicia McCullough last month, or no, today's March 21st. This month, <laughs> at the top of this month, with her uh, story, Superhero Baby Boy, her author interview just came out last Friday, this Friday that just passed. And upcoming is Tracy Cross. She's her episode coming out tomorrow. It's fantastic. It's called One Drop. It's about group work, if anybody knows that we do. Um, I highly recommend it. <laughs> we're also going to be talking about her book that's coming out. So they were both in season one and we're bringing them back for season two, which is what we're doing. We're in season two right now. Keep going. As I said, it's, it's to spotlight these authors. So when we started in the pandemic, we were not recording any of this in person. It was all remote. So as you can see here, that's like doing some remote things. For those of you who are into their shit, that is Kennedy Allen of Black Triples and your weight team and women at work. She knows all things Star Trek. And she was um, an actor in season one and she directed all the episodes for season two. Uh, we also had, as I said, we have author interviews that came out, but in our first season, because we all wanted to gather, we were holding these virtual showcases, as you can see here, with the authors, where we would really construct the whole event around the author's work and how they wish people would talk about their work. And you would get to know them, we would play crazy trivia games about their episode and their stories. It was really the time for folks to be in community together while we were in isolation and talk about this genre that we love. We've since stopped doing our macabre mixers because people are going outside now. <laughs> and so we had our last one in December 2021, but I'm hoping to bring it back when it's safe to gather and maybe do it in person. Fingers crossed, I don't want to say it, I'll jinx it. <laughs> That's my, my little drink. Uh, yeah, so, each month we spotlight the author, but we also spotlight everyone else in the fall. So as you can see here, there's pictures of other folks, the sound designers, and the, here's a good time to press forward. Yes, the sound designers that are also involved in the creation of each episode. For season one, we really wanted to come out swinging, so it's like greatest hits. That first season, that first season it's like, here are all the people that write. Here are all the women working in sound. Yes, we exist. There's pictures of them and bios and pictures of them recording things. It's really kind of like a, hey, we're here, we're out here, come check us out. Also, sound designers never get any love for anything that they do. So I really wanted to have them just featured also like, so, so did this, and they love the horror and all that. So these are some wonderful sound designers. This one is Philly native, Gabe Castro. I think she was here. Not she was, too, virtually. Like, yeah, yeah, virtually. She does the Ghouls Next Door. If you guys have a list of that, check it out. They're awesome. Next one. And also our visual artists. So <laughs> true to form, the visual artists don't have headshots. They have drawings. They can be wicky, they can be wicky, Vicky Wicked. Oh my God, Vicky, if you're saying this, I'm sorry. Vicky B. Wicked they are designed our logo and Madeline Hernandez designed the Dusty Projects logo. Again, I also had moments where we spotlight them and say, hey, these are the folks that do visual artworks as well. You know, seeing a theme, they all seem to be femmes. Yes, <laughs> that's how many women do things in front and behind the camera. It's really important that people understand it. There's many facets to entertainment and, you know, black and brown women aren't just in the front singing and dancing. There's other things that we do. And I just wanted to give a shout out to the actors, all the actors of season one. La la, they're all fantastic. Please check them out. Move forward. Oh, and there's this one aspect, I think, to the podcast that might, um, there are many things that set it apart, but for this one, we've worked with independent publishers and we are, in fact, very invested in that. So we're always showcasing it work from their anthologies and pointing like, hey, this is who published them. Again, this is, I think, an unsung hero in, in, 
in writing as the folks who you know get all these authors together put together these anthologies or you know edit and publish these books and are really just trying to keep people reading <laughs> in a time when maybe folks really don't want to and it's, it's more of a clickbait society at the moment right yeah so like shout out to like reading and literature right <laughs> um so we work with midnight and indigo as well as mocha memoirs press i highly recommend checking out anything that they're doing uh, midnight and indigo has an array of works that they do essays as well as speculative fiction speculative fiction is just one part and they have a of an anthology they put out usually around october or so you know there you know, in the spooky season <laughs> Uh, Mocha Memoirs Press, however, specializes in speculative fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, uh, yeah, kind of, you know, like subgenres within that. So, like sci fi romance, horror sci fi, <laughs> fantasy horror, like all the things. <laughs> so, check out anything that they're doing. And yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that. We continue on with that path, working with new independent publishers this season and hopefully for the third season. Ah, so season two highlights. This is which brings me to the fantastic support of Velocity Fund. For season two, we were able to work with more Philadelphia-based artists because we could do everything in person. Uh -huh. um, more episodes with special guests, as I was saying. We have Flash Fiction Fridays and Final Fridays, so just more folks can be involved and more folks can be uplifted. And international artists. This season, we have folks from South Africa, Nigeria, and the UK. So let's talk. I just did, I did a lot of like talking at you, and I'm not really into lectures. I like conversations. And this is like the most people I've been in front of in two years. <laughs> oh my gosh. So this is the most of me in interaction ever, y'all. So yeah, so I wanted to talk like how has horror and sci-fi helped you through this difficult time? I've heard many different stories of folks who love came to our podcast simply because they they love horror and it helped them when they were isolated and locked in a room somehow, um, different different ways in which this particular genre or the speculative fiction as a whole has supported mental health. I'm seeing a lot of that now, like horror for mental health. <laughs> uh, so I'm just wondering, for those of you who are fans or just kind of like it sometimes, how has it helped you through this difficult time now? Yeah. together 
And I, I think I mentioned at the top that initially this was going to be live, and we were gonna tell these stories live and gather people around in, in like dinners that we would we would organize. Uh, obviously, our first dinner was gonna be March 2020, so yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, but the podcast and everything around it stays in that vein of wanting to bring people together and wanting to gather ultimately so in some way, whether it's virtual or in person, through the art of storytelling. And in particular, just that that very basic human sitting around the campfire and telling you a scary story, <laughs> right? Or sitting around something lit in a dark room and tell me a scary story that everybody kind of, that everybody loves that, whether they love horror or not. Uh, I think it's interesting now with everything that's happening in the world that horror has really moved center stage. It used to be this kind of, as one audience member said, like, we like this too, like kind of like nerd, kind of like out there thing if you were into it. And now horror movies are coming out all the time. Every season, it's not just October, it's not just Halloween anymore. And I think it is, as you're saying, to place the fear that we have to be able to process it because we have so much fear right now. So it's got to go somewhere. So we're asking more of the genre and we're asking the genre to, to, to attack and to speak about deeper themes. A lot of the films that are coming out, it's not just jump scares and it's not just slashes anymore. We want our horror to do more for us because uh, we need more. I used to be really heavily into pandemic movies. Before <laughs> COVID happened, I love like dystopian futures and pandemic movies. And now, for the past couple of years, I have not really watched any pandemic movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mostly because like my partner is like really gifted. But for me, it's, it, it's helped me to also think about like what am I interested in and like what to, like really think more about the type of like sci-fi that I'm consuming during this pandemic, because watching a pandemic film during a pandemic is like really dark yeah. to a lot of people, but to me, I'm on the spectrum, so it's not like I don't think about it in the same way. I'm just like, oh, let's like, it's a pandemic, let's watch a pandemic <laughs> movie. Like, let's watch all of them. But and I, I didn't think about like how weird that would be for, for most other human beings. Um, so it's been really interesting. And I also, I've done podcasts before, but I've never, I write, but I have written. I, like a really long time, and and since she writes, it was interesting to record the podcast together. So that I never would have thought that we would end up doing, but being able to have all that time to like sit and like think about it and work through it, it's really interesting to to be able to help with that process. Right. For some, for some, the time has been fruitful. I think for others, it's been scary. Uh, I think there's a spectrum of that on the other end. And, Maybe many of us fall in the middle, depending on the day or the minute or the hour <laughs> of the week, <laughs> the season. But absolutely, I understand that. And I think I also have not watched pandemic movies since I <laughs> became the star of one, but <laughs> since, it, since it became like a live action role play. <laughs> but um, the times when I think about the pandemic movies that I like, I'm like, God, we got it all wrong. Like now I'm really critical of them. I think about like Outbreak, how I like that movie. Wait, you know that one with Dustin Hoffman and what's the name? It's oh, yeah, I think that's something like that. Outbreak, I think that one, right? Yeah, yeah, like it's like a monkey thing. And I just There's like, like reflecting, I yeah. I was reflecting on that and I was like, that's not how it works. Like now, and I do wonder about moving forward, there's gonna be other pandemic. There's gonna be a pandemic movies about this one. A bit very certain arms, right? So I wonder how in 10 years, in 15 years, how we're gonna look back on this and how this is gonna be portrayed in storytelling. Yeah. What will we remember? What will we take away? Um we're going to tell all our children about it. And they're going to be like, it's so boring. Yeah, when you're, when you're that person. Yes. Oh, I think there's an interesting thing with like horror and sci-fi where like it can help you understand somebody else's trauma. Right? Like, uh, so very sadly, my little brother was recently diagnosed with schizophrenia, right? So I'm like, I did this training thing for like other mental health people. I'm like, just an idiot because I spoke to them. No. I don't understand what it is, right? But like I did this training where like they put these headphones on you and like you hear voices in the chat and you try to like do a basic test. Really long, right? 
Uh, I played this video game, it's called Senua Sacrifice. It's a game pass, play that game. It's awesome. <laughs> but it's about this woman who's going into hell uh, to like save her husband's soul. There's no UI or anything. It's very immersive and crazy. It's like police is coming at you and like you are fighting all these demons and stuff. And like there's something about that, like it's kind of like violent, gory, and weird, but like it can help you understand that somebody else is going. Yeah, I think there's definitely what I mentioned earlier, we wanting more from our horror. You know, you saw that in the pandemic. So some pandemic movies came out in the middle of the pandemic, but you also saw a lot of like, you know, his house, which is taking that horror, that haunted house trope and turning it on its head because they're refugees escaping and seeking asylum. This is why they have to stay in the house. And just having to walk through their process of getting of getting there then the office they have to go to, then getting the house assignment, the rules right. they have to follow. Like, I don't know the process. And even if I read it, it's not the same thing as you You have this couple, you presented them in, in your film, and I have to do this with them. And then the house is on. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? And it's I thought the same thing when I watched hard, it. Like quite uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I thought the same thing when I was watching that, that film. Uh, that was my only like asking question. Do you guys have questions for me? I have a question. What is your favorite horror movie? Ooh, that's really hard. I don't have a favorite horror movie. I have like, I'm really into this right now, you know, like that, like phases For right one. now. I'm, There's one. Uh, what have you been watching a lot of like during the pandemic? I've been watching a lot of TV. Yeah. <laughs> this is an OG classic. An OG know. classic. No. An OG classic. I would say Alien. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Aliens <laughs> plural. Not the aliens first. plural. <laughs> the first one is great though. That's like a that is a very right. straightforward horror movie. The second one is more horror sci-fi action. Like it's it's leaning more into that space. Whereas the first one is just like a few people. It's actually a slasher film if you think about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even though you know you see the perspective of the alien, like you know, <laughs> <they're> like, <laughs> very much my um but I, but I tend to like the second one more. Which one? You ever see a Van Horizon? That one, ooh, the eyeball. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> the eyeball, Sam Neill. I know. Like, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, any other questions? Someone else had their hand up. For me. Or if you just want to ask a general question about life. I have one more question. So, in this presentation, you had all these people on the screen. It seems like making a podcast is like so much work. There's so much involved. How long does it take to make one podcast? Like one episode. Yeah. Wow. Um, like, what is the process? Because I, I mean, it seems so complicated. Yeah, I, you know, that's such a good. When we were doing it in the pandemic, it, it was it would take a month per episode. Wow. We're doing them in real time. So I would say like three to four weeks, but that's not including the prep time, right? So there was this particular season, I changed it again. Thanks to the support of the lost people. This time I changed it, my front ended everything. So we did, we like squished all the things between July and November. And we were doing all, all everything then recording, like I gathered all the people and then just like, if you were like Kennedy came and it's like your contract is in this time and this time and you're gonna do all these episodes. So we front ended everything and we're in post, like we're finishing up post right now. But a lot of things were already in the can before our season even started. So, uh, but it is, it is, so it's a lot of work. It's like a chunk of work, I would say, right? Like it's a good, like, Whatever July to November is about of work to just get it all going. And then after that, you're just put them out. Um, I would say the, the biggest the production is actually quite easy. You know, people come together and record the stories are short, it doesn't take that long. Post-production, I get a lot, I give gave a lot of wiggle time because I want it to be joyful. <laughs> I want this to feel good. Uh, the bulk of the work comes from coordinating with guests and recording the things and dealing with just all the schedules and emails and keeping all of those like threads in line like in a row like no one can talk to. Yeah. 
Um, all the authors are pretty much a joy to work with, but you know, authors can be sensitive, so there's also just like some, you know, producer zhizhing <laughs> as well. Um, and that's where like the work comes. Oh, somebody said something. I think we have a question from Zoom. Oh. <laughs> no, Hi, that was, yes. That was a the first one, that was a shout out to Gabe Castro because I've no Gabe. They're amazing. Um I didn't have a question. I would just agree with you on a producing thing. I'm currently producing a document, a short documentary right now. It's been amazing, but at the same time, you know, you're right about the judging thing when it comes to like working with creatives. <laughs> Yes, yes. And I mean, I'm a creative person, so I understand and I empathize. Yeah. But you know, sometimes it's like, come on. <laughs> come on, Rick. You know, I think we get into this space where we forget that the other person we're talking to is a human because we're too, like, especially if it's your if you're, it's your project or it's your story, you know, you get, you get a little like, tunnel vision. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's hard to let go. But yes, I would say that the bulk of the, that to this person's point here of producing, like it's the pre-production really, yeah. that is the most time consuming. It's getting all the things together, it's getting all the contracts, getting all the scheduling, all of that. Then once you do all that, and then you just kind of like start, and then it's like writing about it. <laughs> like, cause it's horror, right? Like you need good sound, and good voice acting to like yeah. make it happen. It's not like three comedians shooting the shit on the podcast. Yeah, it's yeah. not that, as you can it see, needs, like, it needs to be high production for the actual, now for the flash fiction and final, you know, it's just me and the author, it's me and the guest, so that is kind of like, oh, people just shoot, yeah. shoot the shit, but for the actual, you know, episode that comes out at the top of the, of the month, that fully sound design with, with the actor, with direction, with that, you know, it's still a small team, but it's a team. Uh, again, for the second season, we were able to, being able to do it in person, and also just having like our first season, we were trying to come out swinging and show all the people that are out here. The second season, it was really kind of like, all right, this is the core folks. Sound is one sound designer, one director, different actors, only less actors, like four <laughs> all together. Like we just shrunk it all down, but we could because we could gather, mm -hmm. we could do it in person. So that really helped, yeah. So do you see this as like a theater performance? Like, you know, since the pandemic might be over soon, maybe. The podcast, I, I love this deep dive that I've been able to do into audio form. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to keep this there. Podcast. With, yeah, like Black Women Are Scary producers, BIPOC authors working in the genre, um, and really just going deep. Like, this is how many people are working. This is how many independent publishers. Like, this is how many voiceover actors, you know? Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of folks that don't always get their time in the spotlight and i really would like folks to know that like this is where you can find those people and just be able to continue to create work for them and for, my, for myself uh, but i do think that there's opportunities for i see you you skip me out of time i do think that there's opportunities for live events that can support you know that that overall vision and the overall vision of dusty projects which is just working in these in this genre and showcasing all the bypass creators that live in it yes <laughs> I, I was just wondering, do you do any of that old school sound effects stuff? You know, like <laughs> sacks of flat, Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That foley. The, the foley work. The foley. Yeah. You know, you're talking about like, what was that one long running show, something on the prairie? Prairie Home Companion. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Prairie Home Companion. I know what you mean. We did mess around. <laughs> foley work is super fun. But, <laughs> but it's also time consuming and expensive. And it is easier. Like, there are people who they just they can fully and they go out in the world and they're just like walking around with a field reporter like i don't know putting their mic up to people who are chewing and doing all these things and they have a library so i think from what i understand of gates process she has access to these libraries and it's just kind of like picking all these sounds so she's not really doing any holy work so it is lots of fun <laughs> yeah do you think like your audience is just like deeply nerdy people like in this room <laughs> or do you think like it can expand beyond that because personally i think like every true crime fan is like a closet horror fan. you know like yeah. you should be listening to like cool right i don't you know that's such a good question and i right. feel like i've been to like to, to, to the um 
Moore is going to come up and share more information about the Velocity Fund. Oh, hold on. Is there any way, sorry, um, I forget the presenter's name. Is there any way we can like get your contact? Because I want to talk to you more about your transmedia project that you're working on, because I don't really hear a lot of people talk transmedia. And I um, am curious. <laughs> yes. Can you put in the chat? Yes. Like something? OK, so you just put at Dusky Projects. So at Dusky Projects, let's keep my projects on Twitter and Instagram. And from there, you'll find everything. And as for the podcast, Black Women Are Scary, we are everywhere you listen to podcasts. So Apple, Spotify, Anchor, Wait. Stitcher, all Those the are two different things, right? <laughs> so I'm no, sorry. Dusky Projects is the company that produces Black women are scary. Got it. Okay. Awesome. I'm like putting it in spot. And you are basically the Dusky Project. I am basically yeah. Dusky Project. <laughs> I just followed you on Twitter. Yes. Awesome sauce. All right. Please like send me a little. Can you send me a message there? For sure. Yeah. So I can find you. I'll, I'll, I'll just remind you, I was the only person who did not come in person. <laughs> Say again? He's the only person who didn't come in person. <laughs> <laughs> That's dope. I'm like, glad you came. You're like the cyber, like, cyber <laughs> 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 We feel you in spirit. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All right. The Velocity Fund. Well, let's talk a little bit about, about the fund that helped us do some of the stuff I just talked about. <laughs> Thank you, Emoto. Um, yeah. We're, we're so lucky that she agreed to come and um, talk about her work. That's part of what's really exciting about the Boston Fund is that we get to um, meet more um, really interesting people with really interesting things throughout Philadelphia. So I, um, like, this is not going to be like a full info session because we've really, this session was about you getting to learn more about what we thought I was doing. Um, but I wanted to tell you about the opportunity so that if it's something that you might want to apply for, um, you'll know how we do that. So what we are is um, we are artist grants directly to um, artists and creators here in Philadelphia. And um, our grants are in just $2,500 or $5,000 grants. And um, 
we are really looking for experimental practices that, um, as you can tell from the presentation you just heard, like that really like emphasize collaboration and experimental processes and really connecting to audiences in like fresh ways. We can't like we couldn't ever yeah. You can't have a better tip than that. So, <laughs> So um, the history is, is that we are a regional regranting um, program. So what that means is the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts um, gives us money to fund artists here um, regionally in Philadelphia. We're one of 32 different, um, the regrant has 32 different cities throughout the US. And what the Warhol Foundation is interested in doing is funding sort of under the radar artistic activity. They're based in New York. So they don't know what's going on here in Philadelphia. So they're working with us at Philadelphia Contemporary to get the word out and to support our artists here in Philadelphia with their money. So that's what it is. That's cool. Yes, it's very cool. Well, my job was to just find weirdness. <laughs> <laughs> and so we are looking for artists or collectives or artists run spaces or um, creatives in any way. And as we're um, as we we're talking here, I just put some like grantee examples from Lumoto's year up here, which was last year, 2021. And you can see it's everywhere from like performance work to films to, um, you know, documentaries that are like dealing with very Philadelphia specific topics. And so um, they can be all kinds of things. What we're not funding is 501c3s. You can work with, um, you can work with a fiscal sponsor, um, but we're really looking to just get, they're not huge grants, they're only like, thousand dollars but we just get that money into artists hands right. because first, we like can see project. yes for a project that takes yeah. place in a year here in philadelphia doesn't have to even go the whole year just some something's going to interact with the audience here in philadelphia within the next year and that's what we're funding and you can see that even with just five thousand dollars how many um, like what artists can do with that is amazing all right, so our application is open. It's always a free process to apply. It's about 12 questions. We ask for some visual samples, but there are really small word counts. Um, so that as we're reviewing um, the panel that comes in, it can be a process that they're getting to know you, but it's not hopefully too time intensive of a process. So we try to make it as straightforward as possible. And then we're there to support you the whole time. The deadline won't be until June. Um, we don't fund current students, so we have it in June so that if people are just about to graduate, all of the schools will have graduated. So if you're a matriculating student, um, it's our belief that you probably have other resources that can help fund you. So we're looking for artists at that next stage or artists who never even did that stage. So that's that's why our is funding model. Like, does it matter like what kind of media it is? Yeah. No, it does not at all. We um, actually, that might be the very next. But, oh, we use Submittable, which is a free service. Which you know. Okay, and things have to take within the next year. So as you're going up here, you can see that. So we we funded a podcast for the first time, and so like as a visual artist um, funding industry, like we would have had to answer a question on there, like how do visual arts you know relate to your project? And she answered um, in a way that the panel really appreciated, which was like these are our graphics. This is what we do. This is the transmedia nature of this. And so even though the project was an audio-based project, it's so interwoven in with this expanded idea of what visual arts could be that they fell in love. And so um, Rami's project is like an EP. So uh, it really is. And this year we're also working one of our, I'm one of three team members and Nicole Pollard um, is the curator of live culture at Philadelphia Contemporary. And so she's looking to expand it even further. Like, how could this be more culinary focused? How could this do cosmetology? How could this include tattoo or body art? Like, how can we keep pushing the um, even wider to really, um, to really continue to showcase just like the amazing things that Philadelphia artists are doing? I, I'm sorry, I have a question. Oh. Um, you Oh, what I think on a previous slide, the one that was just up, it, it said that it can't be projects in production phases. Would it be possible? Is it okay for projects that are like, say, in the post or? Yeah, so that has happened before. So this is a, yeah, I, I didn't look it up. So what we're looking for is like a new phase of a project or a new project. So in that presentation, we saw, we said that, Demoto, you already have a podcast, podcast, uh, podcast season one, but then this one in when applied was for the next phase of it. Like how would it, how would it allow you to do that next phase? So for, um, you're, you're doing film, is that correct? Yes. 
Yes, so we have a couple of um, documentary projects and they're, they receive funding for different things. Some, um, some it's already past post-production and what they're dealing with is just the outreach campaign. Like, right. okay, we have this film, how can we get it into schools? How can we have like a toolkit to make sure that now that we have the film, how can it have an impact in the communities that um, we wanna have an impact in? Because um, we were talking about audience engagement before, we're not looking for like the widest possible audience. We're looking for your, the artists who have connections with audiences that this will really resonate with and that there's a need for this programming within that community and the sort of established connections already. So think of it as like a phase of a project, but um, what we don't fund and what will like kind of flag on eligibility is like, you're already like two thirds the way through something and you can't sort of separate out or parse out what this funding would do. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, in our in our newly redesigned uh, website, um, I just wanted to show you here. Um, as you're kind of going around, you'll go to the website and you'll just kind of hit the apply button. Oh, yeah. And then from there, it'll tell you everything you need. Um, in a full info session, I'd lead you through all the questions. Um, for this now, what I want to just tell you is that you're going to need like a lead organizer and that lead artist needs to live in Philadelphia proper, like the city limits. And so that is a, an eligibility, um, is an eligibility uh, must have. And um, the proposal consists of the questions I mentioned. And we do ask for a budget and um, that budget shows us how you would use that money. And in that budget, we really, it's important for the panel and for us, but you're also compensating yourself in that budget too, because you can see how under-resourced we tend to, to be. So as you're doing the budget, please don't think that it needs to be all on expenses and all on outreach. Make sure to also pay yourself for part of that process. And then when you get apply, it's going to take you to submit a form. You um, can use Google or anything to sort of sign in. Um, and you'll just hit the apply now button. It's free as always. And then this is the, like, what kind of, what do we consider the visual arts question? And you can see like, um, these funny play -like, like installations. We helped with the Beard Mobile, um, Bearded Ladies Cabaret truck that is now um, transitioning into a mobile protest unit. Um, we helped with um, Al Muhif, which is a Yoru al Alani's project in which he constructed a traditional Iraqi reed house at the Schoolville Center and then had healing ceremonies between um, himself and his friends and also veterans who spent time at Iraq. So um, Crystal Sotomayor's film was already, to so answer your question, oh. already in that post production. So we're helping with the toolkit that will take that film. Um, into the community and have um, screenings throughout town. And um, in this really brief, book, the main thing is, is that we'll have some info sessions throughout. But if you ever just email Velocity at Philadelphia Contemporary or that gets to me, and I I set up I answer a lot of questions via email, but I also set up like one on one support sessions. If you have questions as you're applying, or you have really project specific things and you want to talk through ideas. We invite an outside panel of curators and um, former grantees to serve on the panel. So I have nothing to do with the, um, the process of who gets the grants or doesn't. I just facilitate the conversation. And so what that means is that my job is really just to be to be there for you as an artist who um, might want to apply. So I can do that and not have to worry about bias because I'm just there to support you wholeheartedly. So um, that's it for the velocity fund. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.